my career, I spent down in the Southwest as well in Flagstaff, Arizona. So I've uh, been blessed to not only live, but also practice forestry and teach and learn in three very different, but very beautiful parts of, of this continent, at least. Done a little bit of international travel and of course have colleagues all over the world. So I've uh, been, been very fortunate with this career. Fantastic. So you've landed at Oregon State University's Department of Forestry. What is the mission of the OSU Forestry Department? The College of Forestry really follows the, the mission of the university around education, research, and teaching. Uh, we're, we're always ranked high, regardless of the world or, or national ranking. You'll, you'll see Oregon State University College of Forestry right there. Uh, most recently, number two in the world, number one in, in North America. And then, you know, we get a, we get a little competitive uh, with our colleagues as well on, on the things that drive the, that rating. But it really is around research output uh, and education, number of students, number of graduates, what they do, all Fantastic. of those kinds of things. Uh, and so, you know, we've got, we've got graduates all over the place. That's both undergraduate and, uh, you know, graduate students. Uh, so the more professionals coming out of the undergraduate program, the more research and science oriented people that come out of our graduate programs, but millions, billions of dollars of, of research. Um, and all of that research is tied to the educational mission, which is not only to have good graduates from a, a four year program and, and a forestry education, forest management education, forest engineering and natural, a broader natural resources degree. Uh, th those are just good educations and, and our graduation, our graduates go on to do great things in a number of different fields. But of course, we also focus on those that go to work in the natural resources fields and, and try to prepare them for, for those careers. And we do a lot of continuing education as well. Great. Yeah. And my question is around those natural resources, responsible forest management. What is it? Yeah. So that is, and responsible is a, a good word. The other that you might hear is sustainable. And of course, mm -hmm. those are connected to, to one another, sustainable over time, uh, responsible, you know, not only to the current landowners and society, but also multiple generations. So we go back to some of those philosophies of will, will the resource be there for our children and our grandchildren? And is it responsible to the land itself? And that's, that's part of this wildfire issue is as we manage wildfire risk, manage our landscapes, is it really just about saving our houses or is there a broader responsibility to the land itself? Right. And what do you think that broader responsibility is? Uh, it's, it's to the, to the ecosystem. Uh, so, so yes, we, you know, we have some people that are very focused uh, on uh, kind of the human side of things. If it's in the wildfire world, it's, it's protecting houses or um, if you work for providing, uh, you know, wood uh, or toilet paper uh, or those kinds of things, you're, you're focused on, uh, the timber and the fiber that's out on the hillside. If you work at a water treatment plant, uh, then you're, you're focused on the, the water resources or maybe you work for uh, the wildlife department somewhere uh, and really focused on wildlife habitat and wildlife populations. But all of those things are out there in the forest. The forest is all those things at, at one time, uh, but, but it's, it's also fuel. And we try to train our graduates to uh, remember that it is also an ecosystem. So it's more than just the ecosystem services, the things that it provides to humans. Uh, it is an ecosystem that deserves to exist in and of itself and, and not just for human spiritual value or scenery or recreational opportunities or, or those kinds of things, but, but just to be sustained through time. That's, you know, a conservation ethic. That's what Aldo Leopold wrote about is just the, the land ethic and the, and the conservation ethic. Right. And I absolutely agree. I really love, you know, being in the forest and spending time there. With that being said, my next question is, what are the impacts of the 2020 wildfires on the ecosystem, especially in you know, the nor Northwest and Oregon? Mm -hmm. And there's gonna be a range of those impacts. Uh, let's, let's, we can focus first on the, just the physical impacts. Uh, and <clears throat> as with all l large fires, and at least as I've been analyzing them over my career of over 20 years now, uh, the, yeah, the, the fire had a whole range of intensities, 
uh, based on fire behavior, the topography, the weather, and the amount of fuel there. And those conditions around Labor Day where, uh, you know, the, the fire was spreading you know, miles uh, per, well, many miles per hour, uh, but overnight it you know, expanded to 100,000 acres and those kinds of things. Uh, a, a lot of that area burned in, in very high intensity, a lot of heat production, so a lot of flame length, a lot of crown fire. And in most areas, that's going to have a high severity, both you know, on the trees and the ecosystem, uh, but also any of the human assets that were in the way, the power lines, the towns, and, and all those kinds of things. And, and so that, that high intensity, high severity fire is going to be an impact that's going, that was big, uh, continues to be big here a month later and will be big for, for many, many years. The areas that burn <clears throat> at a more moderate severity or even at a low severity, uh, you know, where it was just a surface fire and the flame heights were a couple feet and nobody was at risk of dying and trees weren't being killed and wildlife could escape and not too much impact on the streams and the soils and, and those kinds of things. Uh, yeah, those areas uh, are, uh, are already starting to you know, fade in, into memory. And within a few years, you'll be able to walk through those areas and not even realize that you're in the perimeter of those fires. But that's because those systems are adapted to that more uh, low and moderate intensity, moderate severity. Uh -oh. is the amount of the former, the really high intensity, high severity fire, uh, because that that is where we Uh, am I frozen for you? Oh, no. All right, I heard you. Um, let's see, I can hear you right now. Okay. You're still frozen for me, but okay, you're unfreezing now. Yeah, good. All right. Yeah, technical difficulties. You, Zoom world. Yeah, and it's in you know, neighbors starting to get on or whatever. Yeah. Okay, um, it got cut off when you're talking about low and medium severity and the dam different damages between that. Yeah, and so yeah, I can kind of pick up on that storyline of, you know, in the in the parts of the fire that burn at high intensity and high severity, uh, you get undesirable ecosystem and uh, undesirable human impacts just because of the amount of heat that's being produced, uh, the flame links, the embers that are traveling down the wind. And you know, and start spot fires in, in front of it, uh, all all of those kinds of things. A, a little bit of it is quite natural, but large patches of it have raised concerns for us. The low and mixed severity is how these forests um, evolved, and and they're resistant and resilient uh, to that kind of fire impact. And it's also much less dangerous for our our communities and all that are out there as well. So the challenge moving forward is to try to minimize the amount of high intensity, high severity fire we have uh, and shift that to uh, low or, or moderate intensity fire. Because the, the, you know, there is not a, a future that doesn't have fire. Uh,
Oh, we're frozen again. Yeah. Okay, so I got I left off with there's no future without fire. Um, I can just move into my next question. So if there's no future without fire, what policies or actions can humans make or take to, you know, prohibit some of these high intensity fires? Yeah. And that's going to be, of course, uh, we don't have any control over the topography side of the fire behavior triangle. And uh, with, the, with the weather and climate, you know, we have to understand that, but we don't have much control over it either. So the only part of the fire behavior triangle, topography, weather, and fuels, the only part of that that we have control of uh, are the fuels uh, that are out there. And so, you know, we have to we have to see our communities as fuel, the edge of the communities, the wild and urban interface as fuels, and and the broader forest uh, as fuels. And we've been talking about this for a long time, and uh, over ten years ago, developed the National Wildland Fire Management Cohesive Strategy uh, that looks at you know all these the interconnected components of of how we move, how we should move forward, how we could move forward. Uh, and you know, that has now withstood the test of time uh, pretty well. And uh, most natural resources professionals are on board and uh, I'll send you the link for that. Uh, but really it's, it's based around the broader landscape level uh, fuel uh, management, having resistant and resilient landscapes uh, out there. And that is for the value of the landscapes themselves, but also the impact that, they, that that has on humans. Uh, and focus treatments in the wild and urban interface, particularly, you know, as you have to prioritize and focus treatments uh, around uh, large, you know, potential containment uh, areas so that we can better manage uh, these wildfires when they happen. And we can get into those details if you'd like. Uh, then uh, the other leg of, of the stool of the National Cohesive Strategy is having fire adapted communities. Uh, and, you know, that's going to be right at the edge, the wild and urban interface. But some of these disastrous fires that we've seen were actually in grasslands and in kind of shrubby areas. Uh, and so we just have to remember that everything out there is fuel in a future that has wildfire. Uh, and, and so those, those edges have to be designed and hardened uh, to withstand fire risk. And a reminder that uh, because of house-to-house -house fire during high wind events, that communities, neighborhoods uh, stand or fall together. Uh, and, and so everybody's got to be on board. Uh, uh, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna see the inevitability of fire and figure out you know, when, when and how best uh, to manage this future that has fire in it. Uh, and that has everything to do with what we were talking about in terms of the mix of high and low severity fire, because when a, the automatic response is to just put out low severity fires, because we can, it's easy. And I have to admit, I did it in the beginning of my career in the 1980s. I was a firefighter. It's very easy to put out uh, a wildfire under those uh, low intensity fire conditions. But that's exactly when we want them to be burning and really putting it out under those conditions only delays the fire into those conditions uh, where it's hot and dry and windy and the fire does whatever it wants to do. And, and so it, it is not an effective long-term strategy to always suppress fire. And we can do more active prescribed burning as well as part of this uh, safe and effective response in terms of how we manage fires. So those are, the, those are the three legs of the cohesive strategy, safe and effective response, fire adapted communities, resistant and resilient landscapes that those communities set in. Fantastic. Yeah, thank you for sharing those. And my last question for you is, you know, part of being at OSU, College of Forestry is the education piece. So what is the importance of forestry education? Uh, it is crucial. And, you know, it comes back to the undergraduates that come out and go to the workforce. And that's more than just the natural re resources fields. But we can, we can focus particularly on that because of the kind of things we're talking about is, you know, they, they have to uh, have a good foundation of knowledge and be able to communicate it. Uh, and think about new information as it comes out and new challenges that come down the line, like 
like climate change and human population growth and things that, that we as the professors haven't even necessarily thought of yet. But we have to train them to be able to uh, analyze and, and think about that new, the new data uh, that comes in. And then those that don't work in the nat natural professions, um, you know, then you know, they, they still have to be good, good citizens and good thinkers and all as well. The graduate students have to be top-notch researchers doing great science and, and contributing to science uh, there. And that's you know, one of the fields that we lead all the national and international rankings uh, on. And then also I and others are involved in continuing education and professional development programs. I just hosted two weeks uh, here in Corvallis before classes started uh, for uh, keeping the, the professionals that are already out in the workforce and thinking about these issues of sustainable land management and wildland fire risk, uh, keeping them up to date on the information and the models that are available and uh, reminding them of the foundations uh, and all the, the information and philosophy that is behind what they do. Great. Yeah, thank you so much for your time. Um, it sounds like education is a huge piece and, you know, continue that education because you don't just go to school for four years and then you decide to remember it 10 years later. Yeah, I wish, I wish I'd have been ready for everything when I finished my four-year degree. Right. Are or you ever when I finished my PhD. So, yeah, be yeah. A, a lifelong learner, critical thinker, good communicator. I think you're all those things. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. And I'm going to stop this.